Quinn Eastman has been a science writer and an editor at Emory University School of Medicine since 2007. He was trained as a biochemist, receiving a PhD from Yale University and then working in Munich, Germany as a postdoctoral researcher. He now lives in Dem um, Duck, is, how do you say that? Decatur. <laughs> uh, with his family. <laughs> All right, welcome. Thank you, Claire, and thanks to the Hypersonia Foundation. Um, my book starts with Anna Sumner, who was a patient at Emory Sleep Center starting in 2005. Um, Anna was a woman in her late 20s, a lawyer, who came to the doctors and said sleep was taking over her life. She said that she was always thinking about when she could take a nap. There was no obvious precipitating event. It crept up on her during college and law school. And finally, it became too difficult to manage. So at Emory, she underwent an MSLT, multiple sleep latency test, a standard diagnostic procedure, in which she fell asleep super quickly, an average time of about two minutes. But she did not go into REM sleep in any of her five naps in the sleep lab. Thus, Anna was diagnosed with IH, idiopathic hypersomnia something she had not heard of before, and she did not meet anybody else with either hypersomnia or narcolepsy for several years after that. Um, unlike many other people's experiences, there were not a lot of detours where her doctors thought that she had sleep apnea or depression. Do I need to be close to the mic? Um, or sleep apnea or depression or something, or, or something else. The medications available at the time, modafinil and uh, conventional stimulants, helped for a while, but they backfired spectacularly. She experienced crashes that lasted for 24 hours or more. In desperation, uh, the Emory crew turned to an off-label drug called flumazenil. Uh, flumazenil has an intriguing history. It was described in the 1970s at Roche. Its canonical use is as an antidote for benzodiazepines, drugs like Valium and Xanax. It's sort of like how naloxone is used against opioids. If you want to learn more about flumazenil's weird history, it's in the book. Um, because we have limited time today, uh, I'm not going to get too much into it here. Now, spoiler alert. Uh, here, Anna, uh, flumazenil worked well for Anna. At the time when the Emory folks first tried it, there was concern about whether flumazenil might cause a seizure. And she didn't, she didn't have a seizure. Instead, she felt awake like she hadn't felt in years. After some wrangling, she was able to get a, a supply of flumazenil from Roche, and she got her life back. Uh, she went back to work, got married, had a baby, made partner. Now, step back a little bit. What happened along the way is that the example of her successful treatment became a kind of trigger event to bring the hypersomnia community together. Uh, Anna was not at the center of that effort. Other people were. Some, uh, some of them are in this room. So in the book, I talk about how Maybe 15 years ago, in sleep clinics in the United States, people with IH diagnoses were sort of tolerated around the edges. A few of them came to narcolepsy support groups and conferences. The structure of the field and the diagnostic procedures, such as the MSLT, were based on narcolepsy, which was more established. There wasn't much information for people with IH officially. Starting in 2007, there were management guidelines from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. There was no FDA-approved medication. And so the bottom line is that IH didn't get a lot of respect. So at Emory, Anna was first seen by Kathy Parker on the left, and David Rye, and later by Lynn Marie Trotty, who spoke uh, also today. At this point in his career, David Rye was mostly focused on, focused on restless leg syndrome, which is another sleep disorder that didn't get a lot of respect. Um, 
Rye had seen patients like Anna for years, but he became more interested in hypersomnia because of the success with flumazenil, the possibility of a new tool had emerged. So this is why I wanted to go back. Uh, I asked Anna to use this photo for the book because she is wearing her Spinal Tap t-shirt. The photo was taken around the time that she had a lumbar puncture to collect some of her cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. Uh, one of Rye's collaborators, Andy Jenkins, an electrophysiology kind of guy, uh, found that there was some unusual activity in Anna's CSF, something that acted chemically like a benzodiazepine that might explain why flumazenil helped her. Now the, uh, there was already a question about that for already, uh, earlier today. Uh, the idea that flumazenil was counteracting some kind of, quote, sleepy stuff in her CSF uh, that, there, that was the idea. That proposal was exciting for some people and others were skeptical. If you want to know why, it's in the book. Um, so far, this proposal has is been kind of incomplete as far as a mechanism for hypersomnia and the identity of the sleepy stuff remains, remains unpublished. But while Rye and his colleagues were investigating this, they could see the unmet need in the clinic. Uh, Rye had a lot of empathy for his patients. Sleepy people like Diana Kimmel. They felt like they had been given the runaround or dismissed by their doctors for years. They had already tried a lot of the options that were available. Um, and so Diana and others decided this has to change. Let's do what people with other diseases do. That means have support groups. Conferences like this one form an advocacy group, get organized. And that is one, of, I, is one of the key messages from my book. If you feel dismissed, get organized. You might feel like a nobody when dealing with your doctor or your insurance company because you have something that nobody has heard of. But if you have 1,000 or 10,000 allies who are with you, then people will listen. Industry and researchers will listen and regulators will follow. The second message grows out of um, Anna's and others' experiences, and that is that alternatives to conventional stimulants are needed, and that's why at, there's this other break, breakout session which is talking about alternatives to stimulants. Um, and the next two we will talk about, and that is that the history of IH is intertwined with the history of narcolepsy, so I'm gonna talk about some of that history and also say that now that narcolepsy, or at least narcolepsy type 1, has been mostly figured out, IH deserves more study at the genetic level, at the circadian level, at the epidemiology level, and at the healthcare services level. So my, the title of my talk is, is based on that. It comes from something one of the first board members of the Hypersomnia Foundation said, and that's Jennifer, Jennifer Beard, about you know what what people with other diseases do. And I wanted to take st stock and say, how, look how far the hypersomnia community has come, and say, what do you want to see? Um, what I have seen with other conditions like autism is that there's sometimes a clash between what scientists want and what people living with it want, and I would like to avoid that if possible. So what my book is trying to do is to tell part of IH's origin story, not the cause or causes, which are still unresolved, but the story of you all and how you got together. Most diseases or disorders have a human history. Um, like a superhero, they have an origin story. They tell where the, the, the superhero come, come, came from. And I, I found this the other day, uh, talking about uh, superhero origin stories. We have destroyed worlds, murdered parents, genetic mutations, and uh, mysterious power-giving wizards. So you may not feel like a superhero, but you have the makings of one just by being here. The other thing that most diseases have is an estimate of how many people have it. 
so those people can be studied as a group. Until just a few years ago, we didn't have good numbers. And outside the United States, we still don't. So the last part of my talk is about estimates of IH's prevalence. So let's start with some history. There were people who developed something that sounds a lot like IH after a mysterious infection called encephalitis lethargica. It appeared around the world after World War I. This is from the 1934. Uh, it's a first person account from, uh, by, from a woman named Eleanor Carey. Encephalitis lethargica is, remains a scientific mystery. Maybe it was the after effects of the flu which was big at the tail end of the war. That's part of history. Maybe it was something else. And I should emphasize that most post-encephalitic patients had Parkinson's symptoms, such as immobility or tremors. If you saw the movie with Robin Williams and Robert De, uh, De Niro, Awakenings, those people were post-encephalitic. Um, but uh, there were a few who had excess, excessive daytime sleepiness, long sleep duration, brain fog, the whole package, but not cataplexy. They may have received the label of narcolepsy, but usually they did not, or not, you, it's hard to tell with some of these, these reports. A fraction of them did not display cataplexy. This is Bedrich Roth. He was really the first person to define what we now call IH and to describe it in the scientific literature. He was a neurologist in Cold War era Czechoslovakia. He was trained in Paris at the Salpetriere, which was and is one of the world historical centers for neurology. This is where he first encountered people with narcolepsy. Um, in the 1950s, he also trained in Marseille with Henri Gasteau, an important figure in the study of epilepsy. Rote has been called the true father of sleep medicine because his clinic was in Prague was focused on people with sleep disorders before many other places were. Now, an important thing about Rote is that he started studying narcolepsy before the discover, discovery of REM sleep and the accompanying discovery that, um, or it came later, narcolepsy go into REM sleep quickly, the, the sleep onset REM period. For Rote and others at that time, the distinction between narcolepsy and hypersomnia was more about the speed of falling asleep, how irresistible sleep was, and how not long naps lasted. It was sort of like the seized by sleep, consumed by sleep, that distinction that uh, David Rye and, uh, had came up with after throwing ideas around. Uh, this is a key paper published by Roth in 1956. The title translates as Sleep Paralysis and Sleep Drunkenness. I had it uh, translated into English to find out more about the people described in it. It turns out there are 11 people with sleep drunkenness, and four of them are related to each other. Uh, the family pedigree is shown here. We have the mom, the aunt, and the two kids. The mother, Jana, would often sleep more than 14 hours in a day. And after waking up, she was disoriented and felt as if she had emerged from narcosis. Uh, Jana was initially treated for depression with electroshock therapy in Prague. The depression receded, but her sleep disorder persisted for years afterwards. Her son, Alex, uh, the guy at the bottom, was described like this. He falls asleep on the tram in the cinema at a concert in the doctor's waiting room. The sleep sometimes takes only 10 or 15 minutes, but usually it takes about five or six hours, sometimes even 16 hours. They say it is almost impossible to wake him up in the morning. He often falls asleep again. 
Waking up takes about 15 minutes. The patient staggers as if he was drunk. Sometimes he even falls down. He is very rude and vulgar, unlike his normal behavior. He doesn't perceive anything during this time. So that sounds like what, what we, we're now talk, talking about in terms of you know, very strong sleep inertia or sleep drunkenness. And the, exactly, you know, the distinction between the inertia and drunkenness, I, I don't know what that, what that is, and I would like a clinician to tell me what the, about that, but maybe it hasn't, it's, it's not really decided yet. I just want to underline this before I move on. Other investigators have described families like this too. Uh, Michel Billard and Yves Dovier, who are uh, uh, experts in uh, narcolepsy and hypersomnia in, in France. Um, this is a pedigree from uh, something that they published in 2001. And since it is now the 21st century, embedded in my book is a proposal to do uh, sequence, genetic sequencing on families like this. There is a team at UCSF, Ying Wei Fu and Louis Tachek, they have published, published several papers on what they call familial short sleep. Pe that is, people who only need four hours of sleep a night. That is arguably the opposite of IH. And what I'm saying is that somebody can and should study familial long sleep. And just, I'm, I didn't really make a slide on this, but there's last year, there was a paper published from Japan that looks at a lot of people with idiopathic hypersomnia diagnoses, and they found that some of, a few of them have mutations in the gene for orexin, what Ms. Hartman was talking about uh, this morning. Um, now, genetics, I want to caution and say that genetics are not likely to be the primary cause for most cases of IH, but this kind of study can still tell us a lot. Okay, we can move on from this. There's another thing I should say about Rote, though, and that is Sonia Nevshimalova, who worked with him extensively, told me she thought some of the people he classified as having IH actually had sleep apnea. Because she and Rote started studying people with hypersomnia before the field recognized just how prevalent uh, sleep apnea was. So we should take Rote's numbers with some salt. But we can still honor Rote for recognizing when it came to neurological sleep disorders that there was something on the opposite side of the sleepy spectrum from narcolepsy and for highlighting inheritance patterns like this. So while Roth was doing his thing in Prague, researchers in France and Italy also published examples of very drowsy people who didn't display sleep onset REM. And the Stanford Sleep Disorders Clinic was established in 1970. Christian Guillemino uh, published a paper about people who had hypersomnia with automatic behavior. Now, Guillemino was very important in establishing the significance of sleep apnea, but the five dudes in this paper, they didn't have sleep apnea or narcolepsy. I mean, Guillemino would know the difference, right? Uh, this was in 1974, before uh, the, I mean, the, the MSLT was sort of being born around that time. Um, but we don't have information about what... Um, daytime sleep latency would look like for these guys. How, however, these guys were going into microsleeps while they were in the middle of alertness tests. Looking ahead, it gets more complicated. As the MSLT is developed at the end of the 1970s, also at Stanford, and clinical sleep medicine takes off in the United States and Europe and Japan. And you start to see more people who might fit the criteria for hyper narcolepsy or hypersomnia coming into the clinic. Given that complication, I'm going to skip ahead in history, but I will highlight two papers. Uh, the first, I would want to say that my book is by necessity of scope 
focused on the United States. My, my wife um, was asking me just the other day, well, how do you know what, whether the, all those people that Bedrick Roth saw, why, did they get, all get together and, and form a little association? And I don't know that. Um, the, the first example that I know about of people with narcolepsy forming an association is in Japan in the 1960s. Um, but so I'm going to return to just to, to say that there are limitations in terms of my book is focused on the United States, but there is now just as much happening as far as IH research in France and Japan. And in 2009, uh, Isabel Arnoff published this study of 75 people with IH, which is still one of the largest series studied. And so this very, this very complicated diagram here is uh, from a paper that was published around the time when the hypersomnia community was starting to coalesce online and then in person. It's from Dr. Trotty and Dr. Rai and Beth Stop. Um, and this general result was later confirmed by others. It's about the MSLT, which had become the gateway to an IH or uh, narcolepsy diagnosis. But it shows that MSLT doesn't do a good job making a stable distinction between someone with IH and someone with narcolepsy without cataplexy. Someone who tested as having one diagnosis was just as likely to show up as having something else if the test was repeated. This isn't true for narcolepsy type 1. Now, this suggests that the distinction between these two categories, IH and NT2, or narcolepsy without cataplexy, as they are currently defined, is tenuous. OK, uh, on to prevalence. So for a long time, estimates uh, for, of prevalence for IH were sort of indirect. The, some expert says, well, in my clinic, there are one-fifth or one-tenth as many people with IH as the number of people with narcolepsy. So does that mean that the nationwide or the global ratio is one-fifth or one-tenth? It's a starting point, but it's not good enough. For a rare disease, we have different ways of estimating how many people might have it. It's complicated because we can ask people about their symptoms directly, but to know whether it's IH or narcolepsy or sleep apnea, uh, we want to discern why somebody is sleepy and perform complicated tests, and that's more difficult. So we can ask expert clinicians. This is what they do for autism. Um, they actually, I think, the clinical network here, they, they like look at educational records and stuff like that. But these numbers come from a network of clinics, which is supported by the CDC. Uh, to my knowledge, something equivalent doesn't exist for sleep disorders, with, such as narcolepsy and IH. Uh, there are various registries, like a Hypersomnia Foundation registry, uh, with cords. It's a helpful source of data. But you have to volunteer to be in it. And the data is mostly self-reported. So it's not necessarily representative of the whole group. And how, like, Claire, Claire, how many people are in the registry now? Um, I think it's... Oh, sorry. Yeah. I think it's over 2,000. OK, yeah. So 2,000. Um, but another option is um, you can do a survey and call a lot of people on the phone. Uh, Maurice Ohio and colleagues did this. But this shows that a really large number of people, millions of people, say they have excessive daytime sleepiness. An another approach is we can examine a, 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 lo a large-ish group of people in detail that includes having them come into the sleep lab. This was done in Wisconsin. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, lastly, because IH is partly a creation of the healthcare system, we can look, look into insurance databases and ask how many people have the IH diagnosis in their record. Now, to caution, 
these are people have go, who have gone through the complex process of getting diagnosed with IH and have reached the finish line. Lots of other people haven't reached the finish line. So it's worth thinking about how many people are missed by, this, by, by looking at it this way. But th this approach is still kind of what leads us, gets us to some uh, actually realistic numbers. Because I look at the stuff from Mo Maurice, Ohio, and I think you know, the millions of people, that, that's a lot. That's like too much. So uh, yeah, I don't, it's somewhere in between. I'm going to talk about the insurance approach first, because it gives us numbers that are closer to the ground. And then I'm going to talk, circle back and talk about the other ways. Uh, notably, uh, the first people to look for IH in insurance databases and publish it were, surprise, uh, supported by Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Um, in 2021, Jazz was able to obtain the first FDA approval for the IH indication. Um, I could say more about Jazz's product. It gets a whole chapter in my book, but I will abstain right now. Um, what the databases show is that the prevalence of IH diagnoses is about 1 in 10,000. That extrapolates to maybe, where are we? Yeah, 1 to maybe 30, 30 or 35,000 people. The prevalence is rising over time, even in the four-year span of this study. That, that seems like pretty substantial. It is several times less than that of narcolepsy. But keep in mind, for a long time, there was an incentive for people with IH not to have that diagnosis on paper, because it was easier for, to get reimbursement for medications if you had a narcolepsy diagnosis. Despite the recent approval of Zywave, I think that is still the case. OK. Um, news bulletin, uh, I think some, a lot of people know this, uh, but sometimes it, it seems like the assumptions are not there. Um, within the diagnostic category of narcolepsy, the, according to the, the same kind of insurance analysis, the number of people without cataplexy outnumber those with cataplexy in the United States. Now, if you contrast that to the, the picture um, from older papers from, say, 20 years ago, or, say, the clinical trials that were used to get approval for modafinil, most of those people had cataplexy. Um, the first researchers to show this shift uh, were, um, I think, Dr. Mignot was the, the, the last author on that paper. And they, were, they expressed some surprise, saying that their finding called into question the accuracy of diagnostic practices in the United States. But let's like, be real and say that this is a picture of the group of people sleep specialists see in the clinic. So how, the, the question is how to help them. Um, and also that that ratio, this kind of uh, situation, with and versus without cataplexy is likely to be different in other countries. Like, but you know, clinicians in other, like in Japan, I think the, the overall prevalence of narcolepsy is higher in Japan, right? Um, but I, I don't off the top of my head know what, what, what the situation is there. Um, and Dr. Trotty talked about this, um, so I don't need to go too, too deep into it here, but um, last year, people from Jazz presented some insurance-based data, which was interesting because it showed that a lot of people with IH diagnoses, about half, also had uh, the checkbox check box for sleep apnea. And that makes a lot of sense, given what we know. Uh, some people with sleep apnea have trouble with the standard therapy, which is some form of air pressure to keep the airway open. And air pressure is effective for a lot of people, but others have trouble getting used to it or sticking to it. What this looks like is 
clinicians may be diagnosing people with sleep apnea first, and then they say, well, I tried CPAP. It's not working. I still feel like crap. Now what? What's more concerning is that this finding is, the, the, also says that um, at most half the people with IH diagnoses went through an MSLT. That's kind of counterintuitive um, based on what we think about what the MSLT is for. Um, what's going on here? This may point to an ad, in just an inadequacy of these kind of database studies in, in, order, in terms of being able to connect a diagnostic test event to a person. I think this kind of research is important, and I'm glad that industry is supporting it. It could tell us more things about issues like mortality and pharmacy costs, life and death, and money. But I would like to understand the limitations of the data better. And, with, and Dr. Chardy would mention this also. Um, the, Broad, more broadly, this data raises the issue of what's been called the narcolepsy IH borderland or penumbra. I'm not sure if either of those are really satisfactory language. Um, but uh, experts in the sleep medicine field have done a lot of work trying to refine the relationship between narcolepsy and IH. And there's this proposal to redraw the lines, taking into account what we know about the MSLT. And I talk about that in the book. And maybe we can talk about that later. But for these other conditions, the borderland is up for grabs. For example, I remember a distinguished uh, sleep clinician from Finland insisting that if someone has depression, they can't have IH. With all due respect, that just goes counter to what, to what the classical description of IH was. Remember the lady who had electroshock therapy and what the clinical reality now is. And um, there's the whole, you know, overlapping conditions thing. I think Dr. Chadi did that very well, so I'm not going to try and go over, go over that. But what it, d it demonstrates is that there's some conflict between the needs of researchers who want pure populations and the more heterogeneous group of patients who want help. And I'm just mention that um, there's this um, Stanford phone study, and then the more rigorous way to do a, a, a sleep study is to, to bring them into the sleep laboratory. And this allows the investigators to get the objective sleep latency data that they don't get from a phone survey. But it is still confounded by real life that is shift work. If someone is a nurse on the night shift or a truck driver, they will show up as being really sleepy as measured by an MSLT. Uh, Paul Papard was presenting this at last year's sleep meeting. And they, they excluded people whose AHI, that's a measure, that's kind of a measure of the severity of sleep apnea. They excluded people whose AHI is too, too high, which is helpful. But the people who were identified as having IH didn't seem to sleep for very long times. And I just, it's possible that the sample was just not large enough. But I, I hope they're able to validate and publish this. And it, it, it does suggest that the insurance approach, which lo looks at people who have already been diagnosed, may be missing people. And the Wisconsin Sleep Study, if I remember correctly, has enrolled people who are mainly older now. So we'd be adjusting sleep latency times for age. I don't know. Um, let's see. So the summary is that we have the insurance database approach gets us to about one in 10,000 insured patients. The phone survey gives us uh, data for excessive daytime sleepiness that is much, much higher. Uh, we have the Wisconsin sleep studies also suggesting that the prevalence is higher. And then there's some other things where um, 
studies of IH don't always say look at someone's all their thyroid hormones and all that kind of thing. So um, I think this this could be looked at some more. Um, and then just to say we don't really know about other countries. There only recently there was a paper from Germany about what the, what is the actual prevalence of narcolepsy in in Germany. They didn't know before. Um, and so this kind of thing really needs to be done in other countries. And let's see. We kind of come to the home base. And then there's this. We could talk about that if we want it, if, if people want to. Um, I want to point out that this is a insurance, this is a prior authorization criteria for Zyrae. Okay, and then so the, 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 the experts want to say, you know, don't use the MSLT, but everybody has to be diagnosed according to an MSLT according to these criteria. And then I had this idea of talking about how, how you know how we're going to measure how long somebody sleeps, but I, I don't think we have time for that uh, today. <laughs> so um, let me just bring up the very nice some a mention of all these nice people who helped me out. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you. Um, I missed the first part. Did you mention your book? You didn't, did you? All right. <laughs> what well, a bunch of in a bunch of case in a bunch of places I said um, there's this intriguing story and it's in the book. <laughs> and then I went to talk start talking about something else. <laughs> All right, so Quinn has just published a book called The Woman Who Couldn't Wake Up. And it's available on Amazon uh, and at Target actually, isn't it? Didn't we talk about that? Um I heard people uh, telling me that, but I, ha I, would, I would really like to go in the store and yeah. see it because that would be amazing. Yeah, so congratulations on the publication. That book is a fantastic read, and it's um, both, both the history and sort of current stories about people with IH. Um, and I also want to draw our online um, audience as well and those in the room to another book. Uh, if you've not read it, Judy Flygirl's Wide Awake and Dreaming. It's also available on Amazon. And it's a wonderful read. Um, pardon? Sorry. And then uh, there's Waking Matilda. It's also on Amazon, which is more from the pediatric and parent caregiver perspective. And as authors, we love good reviews. So um, congratulations, Quinn. Thank you. All right. Um, Do we have any questions? Um, well, a good way to find find that out is to look at like clinicaltrials.gov and see that what the exclusion criteria are, and often they are pretty strict. Um, and then I know that, um, for example, there was a company called Balance Therapeutics, which was actually the first one in the IH space, and they published some things to say that out of all of the people who kind of came in and said, I have IH, please take me, the majority of them were not eligible for their study. Uh, some because they, they had various comorbidities, but others because they did a bunch of other tests and then they didn't fit according to that criteria. So, there's, there's both, both things are happening. 